Let's begin with a word of prayer. Father God, as we come before you today, we give you praise for how great you are. And you are great. You are awesome. You are true. Oh, Lord, we need your wisdom. We need your strength. We need your blessing. Cover us with yourself, I pray. Lead us, direct us, guide us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, there's this guy named Neil. He, he was a kind and lovable character about town. He was considered by many to be quite a simple-minded man, maybe not necessarily a wise person. Well, time after time, people in the small village would come up to him and offer him a choice between a dime or a nickel. And, of course, he would always take the nickel because it was a little heavier and it looked bigger. And he would always take the larger coin. Well, finally, a bystander could bear this mockery no more. And he went up to Neil and says, don't let these people fool you any longer. The nickel may be larger, but the dime is worth twice as much money. And uh, Neil whispered to him, says, I know that. But if I take the if I start taking the dimes, they'll stop offering me money. (laughs) Well, Yogi Berra was a former New York Yankees baseball player. He demonstrated the linguistic gymnastics that earned him eight entries in Bartlett's familiar quotations when he addressed graduates at the Montclair State University. And he says this, First, never give up, because it ain't over till it's over. Second, when you come to a fork in the road, take it. Third, don't always follow the crowd. Nobody goes there anymore. It's too crowded. Fourth, stay alert. You can observe a lot just by watching. And my personal favorite Remember that whatever you do in your life, 90% of it is half mental. (laughs) That's the wisdom of Yogi Berra. Well, the Bible has a lot to say about wisdom. The most prominent verse on wisdom is Proverbs 9, which reads, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Therefore, a life that is wise is a godly life, a righteous life, a holy life. What does a wise life look like? A wise person will accept reproof and constructive criticism. Proverbs 9, 8 says, Do not reprove a scoffer, or he will hate you. Reprove a wise man, and he will love you. A wise person is disciplined, who is always learning and hungry to learn more. Uh, Proverbs 9, 9, Give instruction to a wise man, and he will be still wiser. Teach a righteous man, and he will increase his learning. Someone who's hungry for knowledge. A wise person is not lazy, but disciplined and working because he sees what he needs and his family needs. A wise person is humble, who seeks the will and heart of God. A wise person submits to God, lives for God, walks with God. A wise person will not pursue the wicked desires of his own heart or the heart of humanity. A wise person instead seeks to expose wickedness and evil. A wise person is just and does not seek to scam or fool other people. A wise person seeks counsel and wise advice. A wise person would rather uh, speak and live with integrity than with the perversity of life. A wise person is not selfish, but rather loving and seeking to give. A wise person knows what is more important in life. A wise person knows what to seek and strive after, how to speak and how to live. A wise person does not seek to oppress another person, but instead act graciously and justly. A wise person knows God is sovereign. He knows God is in charge. A wise person understands the danger of sin and the threat of words. Proverbs 15 says, A gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. A wise person seeks truth and not lies. A wise person is content. A wise person is fully aware of sexual sin and the danger it can cause. A wise person is not gullible, but trusting in God. As we follow, as we follow Christ, we seek wisdom. For we know that Christ is our wisdom. Christ is wisdom. The Christ life is the wise life. The just life is the Christ life. The holy life, the righteous life is the Christ life. Christ is the understanding, the knowledge, and the truth of how we're to live and the purpose of why we live. The foolishness of this evil age will warp the truth and lead people away from the truth. A wise life begins with saying we're not wise. We're not good. We're not living in the manner that we were called to live. We do not like the light of Christ. We shun it. 
That's, that's where wisdom begins, recognizing we need, our hearts have to be redeemed. Our hearts have to change. Something has to give. We need Christ. We're not doing what is right. We're sinful and we need Christ, our Lord and Savior, to save us. So I challenge us today, seek wisdom. Seek Christ. Seek wisdom. Seek wisdom means to seek Christ. Seek wisdom means to act like Christ. Seek wisdom means to live having surrendered your life to Christ. We have surrendered to Christ. Paul said we are to be living sacrifices. We have to have the fat burned away, if you will. (laughs) Surrendering to God is real living. It's abundant living. It's holy living. When we surrender, our minds and body are redeemed. We have to surrender to Christ. We belong to God. We have been purchased by God. We have been adopted into his family. We've been justified, sanctified, and one day wonderfully glorified. Abraham knew about surrender. He had surrendered his life to God when he left his homeland to go where God wanted him to go. He says, go from the place you're living and go to the place that I will show you. And he surrendered to that. He surrendered his future to God's direction and plan. He gave up his life and instead followed God's word and voice. When you surrender, you follow and God leads. God guides. God reveals. We recognize he is God. He is the creator of the heavens and the earth, and he knows what is best for you. He is our wisdom. Well, as Abram began to live in the land promised to his future descendants, he practiced seeking God. He built altars, and he would seek and pray to God. We, too, are to practice daily seeking after God for his wisdom. Well, after uh, in chapter 13, we found out that uh, Lot went east to the area of Sodom and Gomorrah, and uh, that's where he took his uh, possessions, his flocks and his sheep and his servants. And he separated from Abram and he went to live there. It was lush. It was green. It was well watered. But, of course, the cities were not very well. You know, they were bad cities. They were immoral cities. They were evil cities. And he just saw the, the lush green uh, grass and the plenty for his flocks and herds. Well, as, Abra, or as Lot left, Abram, God spoke to Abram and he says, wherever you go, whatever you step on the land, I will give to your children. And he gave him his promise. Uh, God was watching over Abram. And Abram again sought after God. In the meantime, we see that Lot's decision to go where he went was not a wise decision. Uh, he now consistently, as he lived in that area, saw the problems developing and the issues of the day going on and the struggle and the harassment and the conflict. And so when Lot decided to move east, he chose poorly, not wisely. Well, as we look at chapter 14, we see at the beginning of this chapter that the kings in the region where Lot lives become restless and war breaks out. There were city kings. These kings were not uh, kings over a region or a territory, but they were kings over a city. Well, the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah and others wanted no more to serve King Chedorlomer, I guess his name is, and they didn't want to pay him tribute anymore. They didn't want to pay attention to him anymore. So they rebel and war ensues. Well, the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah, they were not strong enough and all these other kings that fought with them. And as a result, uh, they were badly beaten. And Cheddar Lomer then goes to the cities and he takes whatever he wants and whatever he takes. He, he even took Lot and his uh, servants and his uh, flocks. And, and, of course, this proved foolish for Cheddar Lomer and fortuitous uh, for the other kings. So, number one, God protects. God protects. Let's take a look at chapter 14. We'll start with verse 13. It says this, then a fugitive came and told Abram, the Hebrew. Now he was living by the oaks of the of Mamre, the Amorite, the brother of Eshcol and brother of Aner. And though these were allies with Abram, when Abram heard that his relative had been taken captive, he let out his trained men born in his house, 318, and went in pursuit as far as Dan. He divided his forces against them by night, he and his servants, and defeated them and pursued them as far as Hobah, which is north of Damascus. He brought back all the goods and also brought back his relative Lot with his possessions and also the women and the people. So Lot hears about, I mean, Abram hears about this as well. We got to go and rescue my nephew. 
Well, there's a guy named Abera Wata. He worked with the Chinese, or with the Christian youth in the southern part of Ethiopia during the time of the communist rule. That was from 74 to 91. And he, re- he reported the following story to a fellow missionary named John uh, Cumbers. Well, he says this. Word came from the, command, the commandant that the party leaders had studied Abera's report about his work among the Christian young people. And as a result of that work that he was doing, he was, um, he, he, they, he was to be executed because of his treasonous words. Well, the only way you can overturn this sentence, the commandant said to him, is for you to deny you're one of the believers. Well, what could Abera say? Abera told the commandant, if they execute me, I will be immediately with the Lord. And the commandant replied, that is what I expected you to say. Well, as Abera waited execution in prison, Christ gave him songs to sing, songs that he had never heard before. And he turned Abera into a composer. And all the other, some of the other prisoners began to uh, worship with him. And, re- and they were joyfully praising God together. And the guards, they kept trying to silence them. But with the threat of execution hanging over them, said, what are you going to do? <laughs> And they just wouldn't keep quiet. They kept singing. In fact, seven men came to Christ as a result of that singing and worship to God. Well, one particular guard took delight in just mocking and yelling at these Christian prisoners, insulting them. He would actually put filthy words into the the songs that they were singing. And one night he patted down his revolver and says, this is for you. You will no longer be in the land of the living. Well, just after midnight that evening, a tremendous storm uh, burst on the town and the prison. And huge hailstones began to fall. And it began to wreck several roofs, including the one where the insulting guard was sleeping. He became terrified. He actually pulled out his revolver and started just shooting. And he wasted all of his bullets, the bullets that he promised to kill those prisoners with. Well, one by one, the roofs were taken off the commandant's house and the officers of the chief judge, the administrator and his deputy and the prisoners in cells three, four and five got a soaking from the rain too. a bearer's fellow prisoners were in a cell one and they were kept dry. And there were a lot of wet and unhappy people in Yavello that night. Well, at nine o'clock the next morning, while expecting the cruel guard to fulfill his promise to shoot them, they observed a remarkable sight. The same guard who, pushed, who was pushed into a barrel cell without his uniform by the commandant who was whipping him with his belt. <laughs> Other people in the background were yelling, we told this man to leave the believers alone, but he refused. And so God has sent this terrible punishment on the town and prison. He deserves to be given some of his own medicine. <laughs> Well, after some time, the guard released that man and gave back his uniform. And he told a bear and his friends, I know that the Lord is with you. I know the way I should have treated you, but Satan persuaded me otherwise. Please forgive me. They did. And several more men came to faith in Christ. God protects. When you surrender your life to Christ, wisdom is revealed. A direction is given. A path is shown. God protects, and he protects us through his word. He protects us through worship, through the Holy Spirit, through faithfulness, and through obedience. A bear and his men knew the cost of serving God. And it may mean they have to give up their lives. They were willing to do that. This is wisdom. When you know what you have is more valuable than what the world can ever give you. As I reflect on this story of a bearer and his love for Christ, I'm reminded of what it says in Psalm 56. In God, whose word I praise, in God I have put my trust. I shall not be afraid. What can mere man do to me? You can only die once. And then you stand in the presence of the Almighty God. Abram knew the God who protected him. God protected him when he went to Egypt. He knew God would protect him here and now and in the future. After Lot left Abram, he moved to Hebron, which is just south of where Jerusalem is. He became friends and allies with some of the men of the region where he settled. He wanted to live out what Romans 12 said. If possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. God was protecting him and continued to protect him. So the first observation we see is that God rescues. God has rescued you in Christ. 
Well, as Abraham is relaxing near one of the oaks of Mamre one day, just enjoying maybe a quiet evening, or maybe it was an early afternoon, I don't know. Uh, But he was just uh, sitting out there, a fugitive from the battles of the wars that had taken place near Sodom and Gomorrah, uh, straggles into Abram's tent settlement. And and he explains, Sodom has defeated, is defeated. And all that was in the city and all the people that were around the town were taken by King Chedorlaomer. And all that was taken were the spoils of war. That means your nephew has been taken. On all of his sheep and his cattle and his servants. And Abraham knew, Abram knew what he had to do. He had to go rescue his nephew. Earlier in the chapter, we see that Chedorlaomer and three other kings fought and defeated the five kings and their armies. And I'm not sure how many men these five kings may have had, but I'm sure it was more than 318. And Abram recruited 318 of his fighting men in his house, which included the allies that he lived with. Well, a couple of things to note here, if you notice, if you go to chapter 14, uh, let's look at the first part, verse 1. It says this, and it came about in the days of Amraphel, king of Shinar. Notice that name. It's the first king that's listed there. And the first king mentioned in the list of kings of Genesis 14 is this Amraphel, king of Shinar. Now, remember that name, Shinar. Where did we ever hear that name before? If you look at Genesis 11, we heard that name. And Shinar is that stretch of land where they built the Tower of Babel. And Shinar is the land that Nimrod used to build his cities known as Babel, Erech, Akkad, and Kalna. Babel, of course, becomes Babylon, the seat of evil, where one day in Revelation we see it come to a collapse. Babylon is the image of evil, disobedience, and derision toward God, the Antichrist. Babylon is the image of all that is against God. And one day... Praise God, it will fall. This chapter affords us a picture, a glimpse of God showing he is sovereign over all the world, defeating the evil once again. Well, another thing to note is how the destruction of war has involved and includes Abram and his family. The evil of the world he has left has found its way to him. And let me tell you, the evil of this world will find its way to you. It will. And you don't negotiate with it. You defeat it in the name of Christ. Sometimes we flee evil. Other times we stand and fight. It takes wisdom to know which and when to do it. What? Abram knows what he has to do. And he gathers his man. He pursues the enemy. He defeats him. You know, the enemy may be prowling around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. But, to devour, but let me tell you, he is defeated. And since we have the victory, let us pursue The kings that took Lot had already lost because God had promised, I will bless you, Abram. Whoever blesses you, I will bless. Whoever curses you, I will curse. And and the kings who were cursing Abram by taking his nephew. Abram came and rescued Lot. All that was taken from Lot was restored to him. All that was threatened was defeated. Is that not what we have in Christ? Is that not what Christ has done for us? He has restored to us all that sin has taken from us. And the threats of sin are now finally and fully defeated in Christ. You know, similarly in Gideon, uh, in Judges, we find that Gideon fought a whole army, ten, thousands of men, I mean, 10,000 men or more with 300 men. It goes to show you that the battle belongs to the Lord, not to Abram, not to Gideon, not to those around us, but to God. It reveals the power and beauty of God. When you rely on God, you're living a wise life. So seek wisdom. Seek God. Number two, God provides. Let's take a look at verse 17. Then after his return from the defeat of Chedorlaomer and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet him at the valley of Shaveh. That is the king's valley. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. Now he was a priest of God most high. He he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of God most high, possessor of heaven and earth, and and be blessed and blessed be God most high who has delivered your enemies into your hands. He gave a tenth of all. He gave a tenth of all. Abram did. Well, this past week, uh, the man of God named Ravi Zacharias passed away. 
He was a, an amazing man. He had a brief battle with cancer, and he died last week. And we'll miss his intellectual stimulating discussions on how he um, dis- discussed the beauty of God's word. And, and he came against the so-called uh, atheism and secularism that went around. And he was just a, a wonderful mind and a brilliant man, and he will be missed. Well, in one of his writings, he talked about what is called the cum mela. I don't know if I'm saying it right, but that sounds good enough to me. <laughs> the Kum Mela is the largest gathering on earth. And during its last celebration in 2013, it was conservatively estimated that around 10 million people gathered in northern India for this event. Now, the Kum Mela, or, or the Pitcher Fair, takes place every four years. But in 2013, the festival was called the Maha, meaning the Super Kum Mela, which happens only once every 144 years. And it estimated that this kum cost around $210 million, but it brought in approximately 10 times that amount. So it's a big event. Well, Hindu tradition says that there was a war between the gods and the demons over divine nectar. And in the process, four drops of nectar fell from the pitcher, and these, four, these fell on four different locations throughout uh, India, which overlaps the cities where the kum is held. One of these drops fell in Haridwar, where the river's Ganges, Ganges flows, with, while another fell at Sangam. The Sangam is a confluence of three rivers, the Ganga, the Yamuna, and the mythological river Saraswati. The other two drops fell at Kshipra in Ujjan and Godarari. A lot of th- weird words here. <laughs> words I can't pronounce well. And a dip in these rivers... On auspicious dates, during the kum, is said to rid pilgrims of their sins. And then Ravi says this. I find it interesting how many people seek redemption. Anyone who reads the newspapers and honestly reflects on his hard press to deny the reality and universality of sin. Through the ages, humans have tried to rid themselves of sin and its consequences. Religious rituals, idols, journeys, and sacrifices have all tried to assuage and comfort the sinner's heart, but have been found wanting. In the Christian religion, grace that is made available through the death and resurrection of Jesus is the very fount which offers release from the burden of sin and restores our relationship with God. Thus, we can confess Jesus as Lord anytime and anywhere, and we will be saved. It makes one gasp in wonder at the overarching simplicity and compelling elegance of this very good news. Knowing where to find redemption takes wisdom, and God is offering and extending you his invitation. End quote. God is offering you that invitation. We don't have to go to a certain place. We don't have to pray at a certain time of the day to receive it. He has said he's available all the time. And we can go to him any time. And anywhere. So go to him today. Go to him now. As he reaches out and says, receive my grace. Our God provides in the most amazing and faithful way. Our God provides. A wise person knows God provides. So let us seek wisdom. Number one, God blesses. You know, after Abram returned, the king of Sodom wants to meet with Abram. Very thankful that he doesn't have to now deal with this King Chedorlaomer anymore. (laughs) But however, just before uh, this king of Sodom is evil to meet him, another person emerges named this this name Melchizedek. Melchizedek literally means king of righteousness, and he is the king of Salem, which means peace. Peace, Salem means peace. And before the king of Sodom meets with Abram, this mysterious Melchizedek, comes up to him and he brings out bread and wine and this man is the priest of God and he knows and he worships the living God there's no mention of this man before this time nor after this time he just sort of there he is and disappears afterwards you know who is this mysterious Melchizedek you know and as we look at this man he is the image of Christ For Christ holds his priesthood forever. Christ is the final priest. This man is a prophetic picture of what is to come, that Christ is to come. What is a priest? Well, a priest represents God to man and men to God. They're the ones who stand between God and man and man to God. 
Christ is that person. He is the fullness of God, the completion of man. He is the fullest expression of God, the greatest revelation and the authentic man, the authentic human. Christ is the permanent priest who continues to speak and reveal who God is so that we may know who God is. Well, Melchizedek is a, the priest who reminds Abram that God is the creator of heaven and earth and the one who defeated the enemy. This is something the Torah, the Pentateuch, focuses on, that God is the creator of the heaven and the earth. He is the provider. He is the one who's sovereign and who reigns. He is the one who will save Israel, lead Israel, guide Israel, and bless Israel. God, through his priests, blesses Abram. What is rather telling is how this chapter really is a reflection of Deuteronomy 20. How Abram fulfills the law which is yet to be revealed. <laughs> Look how the priest in Deuteronomy 20 is mentioned. Uh, it says this, when you are approaching the battle, the priest shall come near and speak to the people who will say to them, Hear, O Israel, you're approaching the battle against your enemies today. Do not be faint hearted. Do not be afraid or panic or tremble before them. For the Lord your God is the one who goes with you to fight for you against your enemies to save you. The last thing said of Abram in Genesis by God is that Abram obeyed God, kept God's charges, commandments, statutes, and laws. Words that are yet to be revealed. How God through Melchizedek is proving God's true word and real, even though it's not yet fully revealed. Abram's life is the prophetic voice of God's law and God's will. It is God who has blessed Abram. It is God who is the creator of heaven and earth. It is God who saves and delivers his people from their enemies. Is this not the same God that we serve and worship today? Who still rescues us from our enemies? Is it then not wise to seek him? Melchizedek brings wine and bread, which is also a prophetic, prophetic picture of the Last Supper. What is interesting that when you look at, as you read about eating and covenants in the Old Testament, they would have a meal together and then they would have a covenant. And when we look at the communion today, we realize that God has had made a covenant with us through Christ and Christ is that meal and we are friends with God because of Christ. We are reconciled to God through Christ. So Abram then gave him a tenth of all he had. And we seek wisdom. Number three, God promises. Let's look at verse 21. The king of Sodom said to Abram, give the people to me and take the goods for yourself. Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have sworn to the Lord God most high, possessor of heaven and earth. They will not take a thread or a sandal thong or anything that is yours for fear you would say, I've made Abram rich. I will take nothing except what the young men have eaten and the share of the men who went with me. Aner, Eshkol, and Mamre, let them take their share. The beauty of this chapter demonstrates the wisdom that Abram has. Abram revered this king of Salem. He knew who this man was and whom he re represented. 